I now want to take you back to Puddle Town, where Basil and Sybil discovered comparative advantage and are trading fish for barley. They've entered what we call a barter economy, where people trade goods directly for one another. Then there's some new people who've joined the town. There's a chicken farmer who harvests eggs and a baker who bakes bread. Sybil goes to the baker and says, I'd really like some bread. Would you be willing to trade some of your bread for some of my fish? But the baker says, you know, I really don't like fish. So Sybil asks him, what would you like? And the baker says, I could really use some more eggs. Now Sybil takes her fish and goes to the farmer. And she asks the farmer, would you be willing to trade some of your eggs for some of my fish? And if she's lucky, the farmer says yes. Now she has some eggs that she can take to the baker and exchange those eggs for the bread that she originally wanted. Now you can see how this can get complicated. And the reason it gets complicated is because in a barter economy, the only way that you and I can trade is if I have something that you want and you have something that I want. There has to be what we call a double coincidence of wants in order for trade to happen in a barter economy. So now we have all the people in Puddle Town running around, arranging for these sequences of trades, and they're getting tired. It's inefficient. It wastes a lot of time. And so they go to Sybil, who they all look up to, and they ask her, isn't there a better way? And Sybil says, you know, I've been thinking about this, and I do think there's a better way. All that we really have to do is to find something that we all agree to accept as payment for goods and services in our town. Now that something can't just be anything. It has to be durable. It can't degrade quickly like milk or cheese. It has to be divisible. We have to have different units of it. It has to be measurable so we can measure those units. And it has to be the kind of thing that we can carry around in our wallets. It has to have a high ratio of value to weight. And I think I found just the thing. There's this new shiny metal in our town. We make jewelry with it. We decorate our clothes with it. We even make teeth with it. That thing is called gold. So why don't we start using gold and all agree to accept gold for payment for goods and services in our town? So Puddle Town starts minting coins of gold and people carry those coins around in their pocket and all trades happen as an exchange between goods and services and coins of gold. Puddle Town has now found a way of transcending the double coincidence of wants problem that they faced in the barter economy. They no longer are a barter economy. Now they have an economy that's based on what we call a commodity currency. A commodity currency has intrinsic value. The value of a gold coin is, is determined by how much gold there is in the coin, how much it weighs. You can melt that coin and create jewelry, or decorate your clothes, or even make teeth. So the value of the coin is determined by what the coin is made of. Now throughout history, there's been different kinds of commodity currency. A lot of it was gold or silver. Sometimes it was bronze or copper. In small economies like prisons, you may have heard that even cigarettes have served as currency. So now we have people carrying around these coins in their pockets and they start complaining again. They don't want to have to always carry around these coins. So Sybil has another idea. She's going to create a vault and she's going to ask people to put their gold into that vault. In exchange, she's going to give them pieces of paper that say, this piece of paper can be exchanged for a certain amount of gold at Sybil's vault. Since everybody trusts Sybil, they don't think she's going to run away with the gold, everybody places their gold into the vault and gets these pieces of paper in exchange. And now these pieces of paper are used to make trades within the town. Those pieces of paper don't have any intrinsic value, but they are backed up by something that does have intrinsic value, the gold in the vault. So we would still consider that commodity currency. But then Sybil becomes mayor and she has another idea. She said, why are we bothering with the vault and all the gold in the vault? Why don't we just ask the town of Puddleton to print pieces of paper that say, this is legal tender, 
good for all exchanges of goods and services within Puddletown, and it'll have some sort of value associated with it. So these pieces of paper don't have any intrinsic value, but people trust them because they trust Sybil. And Sybil also tells them, you can use th those pieces of paper to pay all your taxes to the town. Now Sybil has stumbled onto a new idea, an idea that we call fiat currency. Unlike commodity currency, fiat currency has no intrinsic value. The pieces of paper I carry around in my wallet, the dollar bills and five dollar bills and ten dollar bills, have no intrinsic value. All I can do with them is exchange them for goods and services or pay my taxes. I can't melt them down and create jewelry. But they derive their value from our trust in the full faith and credit of the US government, just as the value of those pieces of paper in Puddletown was derived from the trust in Sybil as mayor. So we've just gone through a brief caricatured history of currency, and we've arrived at a place in history where countries are simply using fiat currency issued by those countries. Now, oftentimes, currency is confused with money, but money is not currency. Money also, also isn't what we sometimes mean it to be when we ask questions like, how much money do you have? We're really not asking how much currency do you have, or even how much money you have in the bank. We're asking, how wealthy are you? So money is not equal to wealth, and it's not equal to currency. It's something else. So what do we mean by money? Well, economists say that anything that satisfies three criteria is money. It has to be a medium of exchange. It has to be a unit of account. And it has to be a store of value. Now, there are many ways in which you can store value. You can buy Amazon stock and store va your value that way. But you can't use that Amazon stock at the supermarket to buy milk or eggs. You can't use it as a medium of exchange. You can store value in real estate, but you can't use that real estate to buy milk or eggs. And it's not a good unit of account. So lots of ways to store value. And when people ask how much money do you have, and they really are asking how wealthy are you, they're asking how many assets do you have that store value? So what is money then? Well, money certainly includes currency. Because currency is a medium of exchange. You can buy those milk and eggs with it. It's a unit of account. It has some dollar values printed on it. And it stores value. So outstanding currency, currency that's floating around in the economy that is in people's pockets, is part of money. But what about a checking account? I can link a debit card to my checking account, and I can use that card in the supermarket to buy milk and eggs. Or I could simply write a check. Or a savings account that I can link my debit card to can serve a similar purpose. So those would be considered money. Now, there are other things like a certificate of deposit that you might hold in a bank that can't directly be used to buy milk or eggs, but can easily be exchanged for currency that can be used to buy milk or eggs. So we can debate whether certificates of deposit should belong in our definition of money. In fact, there are different definitions of money. But for our purposes, it's good enough to say that money is equal to outstanding currency plus what we call demand deposits. Demand deposits are deposits, usually at banks, that we can use directly to pay for goods and services, like checking accounts, savings accounts linked to debit cards, and so forth. So that's what we're going to mean by money. Money is simply outstanding currency plus those demand deposits.